Hey guys, it's Kirsten and this week I'm coming to you from Austin, Texas. I'm so excited to be here. I don't know if I mentioned it before in my um, like kind of update video, but I'm here for the week, guest teaching at the studio. I will actually have the privilege of teaching at next year, like dance year, school year, <laughs> starting in August. Um, I highly recommend the school. It's called Ballet Arts of Austin. If you're in town, please consider taking a class here or even registering. There's quality training there and I'm just so honored to be teaching here this week and um, in the future. So also, I offer private lessons as well. So if you're interested in that, please do get in contact with me. I'd love to talk to you. Um, but that's not what this video is about. Uh, today I want to try something new and I will probably make several videos like this in the future but I really wanted to start commenting on current um, articles you know different things on the popular publications such as Point Magazine and Dance Magazine and anything else on the internet that is really getting some attention about dance. I'd love to comment on current events in the dance world because I think it's super important to stay updated and also it's just great to continue this conversation about how dance is evolving and how we can evolve it in the best way. So anyway, um, today I'm going to be commenting on an article found in Dance Magazine. I believe it was in the January-February issue. I'm just looking at the online version of it here. I will post the link down below. It was published, I think, February 19th online. So, um, yeah, if you know which month the um, magazine that this article was in, please comment down below. I'm sure people would want to flip through if they already have the magazine. But it's called, Is It Time to Completely Rethink Ballet Class? And I thought it was an extremely intelligent article. I love that they brought up the history of how Agrippina Vaganova was really a revolutionary within ballet, and she approached ballet classes and the way she formulated um, her training methods in almost a scientific way. She was very forward-thinking and that's how this article starts. I just thought it was a great thing to mention her and how um, the training she provided produced amazing dancers like Rudolf Nureyev, even Natalia Makarova, and later Mikhail Brzezhnikov. Um, so she trained all these amazing dancers and at the time she was doing things that were very um, different, not quite the norm of her time. So um, what this article is commenting on is that the way we've been doing class for the last several decades hasn't really seemed to change that much. Despite the fact that repertoire is really changing these days, it's going in quite a contemporary direction. So you would think with that and also um, the higher standard of technique these days, the expectations that dancers are really going to function like athletes, you would think that ballet classes would have changed a little bit more by now. I'm really interested in this discussion, so I'm excited to comment on my points that I've come up with after reading the article. So here we go. One of the first things that the article points out about uh, actual classwork these days is that um, there's no element to, in a typical ballet class that helps the dancers to be ready for how versatile they're expected to be in repertoire. My opinion is that in order to accommodate all the contemporary work that classical ballet dancers are asked to do these days, I think that we can, as teachers, um, or teachers, not all of you are teachers who are watching, I'm a teacher, so um, it's interesting to talk about this as a dancer and a teacher, but um, I think that we could talk more about spinal articulation in ballet class. I had an amazing instructor at Houston Ballet who actually introduced the concept of the chest moving, um, you know, around the sternum area actually moving as if you know it moves when you you breathe she also talked about how you could breathe laterally like have your ribs expand out to the side and um she talked about allowing the chest and ribs to expand in such a sophisticated way that it really helped me to um, think critically about how i can really expand my chest at the right moment and incorporate a breath into that movement so it is an authentic expansion of the chest and then actually allow it to contract slightly. I'm not saying have the shoulders go up and forward and the chest cave in, but there are moments where it is appropriate to have more relaxation in the chest so that the opening can be um, emphasized. So common ballet technique these days doesn't really talk a lot about that. 
and not there's not a lot of talk about true spinal spinal articulation a lot of the traditional ways of teaching focus on just the very upright posture of ballet and so many young dancers and well not that young are getting stuck in this very like stiff upright posture and that works so hard against them in contemporary work so i think there could be more talk of energy, um, breath, expansion and contraction of the chest, spinal articulation and ballet class, as well as dynamics. Now, my point that I want to make that wasn't made in the article is that I really think more teachers need to be well versed in understanding musical principles. They need to be able to um, understand rhythms. I, I made two videos recently about musicality, so I'll link those in the cards and below so that you can check them out if you haven't already. But I think it, it is extremely crucial for all dancers to have a basic understanding of music. Then, well, not just dancers, but especially teachers, because they are the ones that are going to be able to transmit that knowledge of musicality, how to um, dance along with the dynamics of the music, how to really play with it that is such a crucial thing in professional work especially not just it obviously serves you in classical ballet technique but also in especially in contemporary work you really need to be understanding of the dynamics of mu in music and how that can affect the quality of your dancing i find that way too many teachers these days just say the counts get the steps out and then let the dancers do their things they only talk about counts and not rhythm and not quality or dynamics or you know the texture within the music that is so important to creating a seasoned dancer through good training another just opinion of mine is that i really think um, every professional training program needs to obviously incorporate um, modern or contemporary classes, but not just any modern or contemporary, though I do think it's really valid for every dancer to experience classical modern technique at some point because it is a huge part of where the ballet scene is today. It is historical, it is important, just I think like understanding the very classical forms of ballet is super important. Like everyone needs to experience Bourneville at one time. I think every um, pre-professional or professional dancer needs to experience classical modern technique. However, I do think it's really important for dancers to be consistently exposed to forward thinking work, taking good modern and contemporary classes that kind of push the boundaries that have a good focus on improvisation. This is so important because a lot of choreography these days want to work with forward thinking, independently thinking dancers who know how to improvise something on the spot, who know how to have their own voice, their own way of moving, who understand themselves and aren't just constantly told what to do and then they do it. I also think that character classes are actually really important. I used to not really agree with that when I was younger, but now when I see true character classes that are taught by a good instructor who understands the tradition of character dance and they understand also how to teach a well-rounded class that acknowledges um, many different um, national dances and uh, steps and ways of uh, doing character. Um, it is such it's such a good opportunity for students to understand how to be more presentational. They understand a palm law better, rhythm. You can't do um, all the intricate footwork and uh, stomping and the rhythms and all that without understanding um, musicality. Here's a big point that the article makes and I totally, totally agree with it. It acknowledges how ballet dancers have to cross train out the wazoo these days in order to do rep. It is completely true that ballet class does not prepare dancers for the rep we're asked to do today. Even the classical stuff that's been around since the late 1800s, we're not able to do it without getting injured typically 
without extra strengthening on on um like outside of class you have to typically do cardio to be able to do that well to you know still have your toes pointed at the end of act two of whatever classical ballet or act three or four a lot of dancers like myself have to do pilates for strengthening to be more placed to have even just hit be toned so you look good as a ballet dancer people have to cross train and i think this says something about um, ballet class. Don't get me wrong. I love ballet class. It's a ritual for me. I love it just as it is. But wouldn't it be nice if it actually worked for us a bit more? I think so. So I really love the article referenced in one of the later paragraphs in the article. It's called Cardio Respiratory Considerations in Dance from Classes to Performances and there's a link in the article. It talks about the idea that maybe at the end of class there could be um, like five minute aerobic sets where you're doing uh, 20 second sets of Grand Allegro and then with two minutes of adagio, adagio steps interspersed between the five minutes of Allegro sets. That really interested me because most, most dancers in classical ballets or just any sort of pieces that you totally have to do that all the time. You do all this jumping, like say in the vision, scene, the vision scene in Sleeping Beauty. That is a killer, okay? Not enough people talk about that. Um, so I was one of those dancers in act two of Sleeping Beauty and we had to do all this jumping and then stand there for two minutes on the same leg, same for Swan Lake. You stand there for longer in Swan Lake. Um, and that usually leads to a lot of injuries. You find like everybody's left ankle is hurting because you did all this physical, like huffy puffy kind of activity. And then you stood there still lo on, locked on that ankle and you're probably pronating. So I thought that was an amazing idea that teachers can involve um, like an active recovery phase with intermittent aerobic aerobic exercise at the end of class. We can do steps we know we're familiar with, but it works on really going for it and then being slow and controlled. So you're using your muscles in a totally different way and that definitely prepares dancers better for repertoire. I also love this point that the article made, again, on one of the later paragraphs. It says, um, a number of studies show that bar is not as effective in training dancers balance as is commonly assumed. Curious about the transfer of training from bar to center, Virginia Wilmerding, a researcher professor, a research professor at the University of New Mexico, carried out an electromyographical comparison of a développé devant at bar and center and discovered that the standing leg works 50 to 60 percent less while using the bar. So I think this is huge. Um, obviously you are relying on the bar whenever you're using it you're hopefully you know a lot of times we talk about the bar as a setup for center you have that um, that ability to not focus so much on your balance but your placement and then you take that kind of warm-up you're working on your technique your placement and then you do more um, active balancing in the center of course we all know that bar is um, like we're meant to rely on the bar in a sense, like within reason, and that is supposed to ease us into center work. However, I think one really easy fix is to just create more combinations as a teacher that don't rely on the bar quite as much. Tell the students, go up into this rusty ray or something without using the bar. Um, the second set of tondus, or on the reverse, we're not going to use the bar, or only put one or two fingers on the bar. I totally want to implement this in my classes now. In fact, I'm going to do it tonight. That is such a good idea. It involves, it helps the dancer to involve their core more in their work, as well as work the standing leg, which obviously is going to be a more necessary thing to focus on based off of the findings of that researcher. That's really amazing. So, um, bar is still valid. Um, one dancer comments on that paragraph in the article saying that bar is really like mindful. It gets her centered on um, or into a state of mindfulness. And a lot of people like bar because it is more mindful. You feel very centered. It's, come up, it's almost like meditative. And I agree with that. Um, so I'm not saying ditch the bar altogether, but we could definitely as teachers and even as dancers, if you're just a dancer, not a teacher, you don't have to wait for a teacher to tell you to, um, you know, take your hand off the bar. That's, I'm sure, certainly encouraged. So 
um, that could be a really good step forward in increasing stabilization. Continuing the discussion on stamina though, I do also think that more teachers need to create longer combinations or have them have the students repeat the combinations back to back. That is so important um, in preparing for repertoire or also just keeping your stamina up. That, that's just amazingly crucial because it's not just strength that keeps you from being injured, it's stamina. My last note before I finish this video is that I do believe dancers should still cross train and I do believe that it is still the dancer's job to do a strengthening warm up routine before class. Not just stretching, you definitely need to warm up your body a little bit more, get that blood pumping a little bit, um, get yourself loosened, and most importantly, getting the muscles to engage before you call on them in these kind of dangerous posi positions that um, require flexibility. That is so important so that you're not just hanging and putting too much stress into your joints. Also, if you're a dancer that doesn't really warm up before class or if you just stretch, that is not such a good idea because if you come into class ready with your muscles already um, prepared to be engaged properly and to support your body, you get m you are more efficient with your classwork and you get more out of class from the very beginning. If you're just kind of going into plies, treating it like your stretch and your warm up, you're missing out on some strength building and some technique that you could be gaining. Instead, um, with that sort of practice, you're just treating it like a warm up. And warm ups are never meant to increase your skill or technique or your stamina or your strength. It's just to prepare you for the rest of class. So I do still think that it's not technique class that has to change, but a smart dancer that needs to come into class already ready. Whether you just do a couple minutes of Pilates, you um, walk to the studios if you can, get on a treadmill, even if there are stairs in your building, go up and down the sta stairs a couple times, do some ab work, do something, warm up at least some part of your body. It is so important. So with that guys, I will leave you. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, subscribe, all that good stuff. Thanks for sticking around and I will see you next time. Bye.